I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome to the Playing FTSE podcast. My name's Paul and each episode, me and the lads get together to talk about the stocks, stock market news and finance in general. Quick disclaimer, you shouldn't consider anything in this podcast as personal financial advice. If you need such advice, go to a financial advisor. And please remember when investing in any form, your capital is at risk. So sit back, relax, and let the lads fill you in with all the stock market news of the week. The sucker's going up. Uh, the suckers going up. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to the Playing Footsie podcast. Uh, you've got me, Paul, and you've got Steve W and Steve D today. Uh, we've got a big one today. It is earnings week. And to me, uh, because I haven't followed it that well, I must admit, there is a lot that's happened. And we've got a lot to talk about today. So, uh, first of all, we'll say hi to Steve W and Steve D. How has your week been? And how has your week been with the stock market? Hey, I've had a pretty good week, Paul. I've, um, I, I don't know whether you noticed um, during the week, but there was the launch of the ticker meter. Um, I don't know if you've come across that, Paul. Do you know what it is? I haven't, no. No, no so, okay. Um, um, a couple of uh, creators have got together on Indiegogo to produce a little, it's just like a little box about this kind of size, and it'll display the tickers in your portfolio and the current price. So I thought behind me would be a lovely place for a little floating shelf, and perhaps while the podcast's on, I could display the ASML <laughs> price for you every day. Well, actually, I'll tell you now, like, the the the, the thing for ASML for me was that I had a choice. I had a choice between ASML and KLA. And KLA today has gone up 10% just in the one day based on the the 2 billion share buybacks and the 17% dividend hike and absolutely crazy, crazy numbers. So I'm not actually feeling too bad about that today. I know ASML went a lot further, but I think people are starting to discover KLA now and exactly you, you what did, sort of moat that, that company has. You did have the option to buy both. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think no. I think at the time, ASML was you know what you would classically describe as overvalued, um, but it clearly, well, it isn't, is it? But um, KLA wasn't. It was, it was very low on its price price to free cash flow, very low on its uh, price to earnings at the time. And I think I caught it just as it was going to start to take off, and yeah, I, I, I made a pretty good call at that point I, I feel so i'm quite happy about my choices to be honest with you um and, and in fact this week has just gone absolutely mental emerging markets are down because of the china fiasco uh now i've got three reds in my portfolio which i haven't had for a long long time um but it, my portfolio is up simply because of the semiconductors and google and everything that's happened this week so yeah it's a it's a strange one it's a bit of, it, it's like my i've got this barbell portfolio where one side goes down the other side goes up and it keeps it just like totally straight how about you steve how's your week been <laughs> Uh, my week's been good as well. I don't have a barbell or whatever that is. People talk about these things quite a lot. They talk about them in trading <laughs> terms as well. But happily, uh, even without having a barbell, my portfolio is also almost completely straight. Uh, and that I've just not chosen anything that seems to have gone anywhere much until today. Uh, we're recording this on Friday, so it's after pretty much all the earnings have come in because there's nothing after market close on uh, Friday evening. Um, and I guess most of what I've been thinking about is uh earnings and we'll kind of cover that on the pod but yeah nice enough week in stocks nothing quite so exciting as steve's latest acquisition by the way your audio sounds great today steve w sounds very very good thanks you, you've, have you done something different with your hair <laughs> um okay yeah so today uh, we're going to start off with a game we're going to start off uh and then we've got a lot of earnings reports that we just want to go through some i think people have got very um uh, uh, these guys have got a lot of details on uh, some, not so much, but we're just going to cover them because they are absolutely mental. Uh, mental things have happened in the market, so I'm just going to uh, list them off: Starbucks, Pinterest, Teladoc, Amazon, and Google. So if you're interested in any of those stocks, stick around because we're going to talk through them and give our opinions on them. First of all, though, we're going to start off with a game, and I guess that's Steve W's chance to introduce his brand new game. Yep, I have a brand new game, and I'm calling it Playing Footsie Pointless um, on this occasion. So oh. I decided that... Oh! <laughs> 
You sound like you've heard of this game before, Sorry. Paul. I mean, I thought of no, it like well, half an hour I'm, ago, I'm, so... <laughs> I'm hoping that really uh, like you're basing Osmond. this off... Yeah, I, I was thinking that. I was thinking, like, oh, I've always wanted to play that game, and I'm hoping you've based it off something like that, but I bet it's not going to be, is it? It's sort of like that. So unlike um, okay. Pointless, I didn't have lots of people to go out and ask questions to, especially in the last half an hour. Um, and so <laughs> I've, uh, I've come up with a game where, yeah, the idea is to score as few points as you can by giving more obscure correct answers, basically is what you're looking for here. Uh, like and since I've it. called it Pointless, I thought we should also talk about something that's fairly pointless. Uh, and I've selected the Dow Jones. Um, so the Dow Jones is a US <laughs> index of 30 stocks. Uh, which is unlike the S&P in that it's not particularly traded or anything like that. And it's weighted by share price rather than market cap. So it doesn't actually matter how big the company is by market cap. It takes up a bigger proportion of the Dow if its share price is higher. So if you reverse split all of your shares, uh, you actually become a bigger part of the index, if you're a part of the index at all. So here's how this is going to work. Um, you guys are going to take it in turns to tell me a company that's in the Dow. Um, and you will score points according to how big its market cap, uh, not its market cap, its share price uh, is. And the way I've worked this out Ooh. is um, I've worked out the weightings for each of these, uh, true as of this morning. Um, and uh, if you give an incorrect answer, you'll score 10 points. If you give a correct answer, uh, you will lose a point off your score for every percentage of the index that the share takes up, basically. So if you said, for instance... Uh, NVR, which is not on the Dow, but has a massive share price, that would be a big weighting. You would score relatively few points. Uh, Got it? I, well, yeah. I was gonna I was gonna say I was gonna say, could I just choose one that's not on the Dow? No. <laughs> but um yeah, it's uh, if, if you okay, do, this is do that, this is really that scary. makes my life easier yeah. because I'm gonna have to add these scores up. Um and if you choose something that's not on there, I can at least add ten to something. Uh, yeah, okay, Paul. Um, the Dow is an interesting sort of index huh. for a number of uninteresting reasons, but why don't you tell us about a company that you think might be on it? Right. Okay. Um, at the moment, I, I'm looking for the smallest share price. On no, the biggest Dow. share price. Oh, you want me to... What? So I've got to guess the higher share price on the Dow. Yep. Thing on the Dow with the biggest share price. So that will take up more of the index oh, right. okay. and will take more off your 10 score. Giving you a smaller oh, right. number. Sorry, I was going the opposite way. I think we, I thought we were thinking of obscure companies the on the Dow. Hmm. Okay. I knew I shouldn't have made Paul go first. <laughs> yeah, that's what... Yeah, I know. Sorry, I was trying. I was trying to think of companies that were small on the Dow. Oh, uh, big wait, ones. Wait, wait, wait for a second um... until Paul gives you a number. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Bloody hell! What? What? I don't even know share prices. <laughs> so I'm like, oh great. Uh, th this is not a good game for me. <laughs> I have not understood any of what this game is about, have I? <laughs> I'm sitting here. So you want? So you want me to guess? A company on the Dow and the share price. That's what you. That's what you're asking me to do. Yeah, and then I want Steve to edit out the last five minutes or so. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> be all right. Just leave it in. It sounds. I'm, I'm an idiot. Uh, okay then. So on the Dow, uh, we have. I don't know what price that is. So <laughs> I'm going to go with. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with. 3M's on there at 155. Sure, you yeah. don't have to tell me the share price, but 3M is a, a perfectly good company. So you are correct with 3M. Ding! There oh, we yes. go. Nah. I'll, just do, Thanks, I'll just do the sounds, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. 3M is indeed uh, on the Dow. It's Actually, when I looked last, its share price was about 198. So you're doing better than you thought with that. Oh, uh, yeah. It takes up yeah, it probably 3 point. Actually, yeah. 8.4% of the Dow, giving you a starting score of 6.16. Uh, you're aiming for lower, obviously, this being pointless play. No. Obviously. There isn't a pointless answer, obviously. Anything not on the Dow is uh, no part of the index. Okay, Steve, well, uh, got I'm the hang of it yet? This, yeah, I'm going to try and play this tactically and just basically go for something that's sort of, that I'm pretty confident is bigger than what Paul's picked. So I think 
I'll go with United Health Group, which I think is in the 400s. Ooh. Uh, Steve, you are also correct. There we go. Uh, you are also right in thinking that United Health Group is in the 400s. When I looked earlier, it was around 412, uh, obviously moving a little bit because market's currently open. Takes up 7.33% of the index, uh, giving you a score, starting score of 2.67, which is very low. Nice. Okay, Paul, think of very another good, boring good. old company, which is mainly what the Dow is full of. Yeah, that's, so KLA has got is got to be around 315, 330, something like that in the minute. That is on the Dow, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is on the Dow, yeah? KLA? It's your company. Sorry, KLA is your answer, yeah? <laughs> yeah. It's not on the uh, Dow, is it? <laughs> okay. You are correct, Paul. KLA is not on the Dow. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's a tech company. <laughs> I thought it was an industrial. Uh, okay, 10 points to Paul. Uh, Steve, another, I've had a long another day. Dow company. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll just take the obvious one then, which I think only got added fairly recently, and I'll take Honeywell, which is in the 180s, I think. I knew you were going to say Honeywell. Uh, okay, so you are correct. Honeywell is on the Dow. Uh, it's a bit higher than 180 now, though. It was 180 when we were looking at it last year, I think, or around 160, mm. 180 ah. around that time. It's now 233, uh, and it takes up 4.47% of the Dow, meaning you score 5.53 points and become awkward to add up. Uh, Brilliant. That's a, uh, that's a big one. I thought Honeywell was like $50. I just said, that's why I didn't guess it. it was about, I thought it was about $50. Oh, well. Uh, okay. Um, ah, shit. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I've got nothing. Uh, so United Health Group, see how far that gets you. <laughs> yeah, cheers. This is not a good game for me because I have not got... Why can't I name anything? No, the Dow I'm isn't a very popular on this. index, is it? So the, the actual companies... I mean, I know, I know people are on it, but I, I know that they've not got massive share prices, so... Yeah, it's like... I'm, Pretty sure Apple's on the Dow still, and that's just in a five for one split. So uh, that's going to be a pretty low, uh, low share, uh, low market share of the of the Dow at the minute. So, but I'll go for it because I can't think of anything else at the minute. Hmm. Everything you say there is correct, Paul. Apple is on the Dow. Uh, and yes, unfortunately, having had a split, uh, it takes its percent of the Dow down, obviously. So that makes no difference to a market cap weighted index like the S&P. It's still at the top yeah. of that. Uh, but where the Dow decides to uh, order things by share price, another pointless feature of this, um, that now takes up 2.57%, yeah. meaning you score 7.43 points. It's better than the last one, whatever you said, KLA. Uh, so I think I just need a right answer, and then I can just like make companies up. And so I'm gonna try, and I think they're quite expensive. The paint company, Sherwin Williams. Sherwin Williams says Steve D. Uh, Steve D is incorrect. <coughs> Sherwin Ooh. Sherwin Williams is not on the Dow. You are right in thinking they are expensive, though. Um, hmm. uh, ah, ten points. Okay, Paul, let's hear it. Uh, LMT, it's got to be Lockheed Martin. That's got to be Lockheed on the Dow, Martin. So. Uh, Dow Jones being of course short for the Dow Jones Industrial Index. Lockheed Martin being a massive industrial, it is unbelievably not on the Dow. Oh wow! Oh, what? 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 No, I made the index. <laughs> oh wait, this Lockheed Martin. No, I'm kidding. It's not. I mean, <clears throat> no, no. I mean, you're saying you you you're saying that it should be obvious, but. Uh, Raytheon recently got kicked out of the Dow, and that's obviously a. Uh, I suppose it's an aircraft. Oh, there you go. I've just given you the next one, haven't I? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Have you, Steve? You'll go. Yeah, I'll go with Boeing. Yeah, I think I have just given. Oh, that, that was. <laughs> I see what you've done there. I just uh, gave it. <laughs> yeah, Boeing priced at two hundred and twenty-six dollars a share, roughly at the moment. Takes up four point nine two uh, percent, giving Steve a score of five point oh eight. Uh, last one, Paul. Um, I Why think is need it a good so hard to? Yeah, I need. I need the. I need the number one. 
Number but you're going to say, Dow, why then, is it so hard to think of companies on the Dow? The answer is because no one cares about the Dow because it's ridiculous. <laughs> and that's why it's in this point. <laughs> it thing. is, isn't it? It, it really is. You it had really a perfectly is, sensible suggestion I mean, with Lockheed it... Martin, by the way. I thought so, too. I was yeah. excited when he came up with it. <laughs> yeah, because I thought it's got a pretty, pretty high share price. And then I gave you straight to... Oh, God. Um, oh, just any industrial company, then. Um... <laughs> God, I wanted to go with Tyson, but that's about eighty. Uh, it's about eighty dollars at the minute. It's going to be fucking useless. Um, oh, something big, something big. Uh, let's go. Uh, what's the price of Dr. Horton, Steve? At the minute, is that on? It's about one hundred and ten, isn't it, or something like that? <laughs> that's not high enough then. I don't know. Oh God, I've got nothing. I've, I've honestly, I've, uh, my mind has gone blank. You've, you've totally stumped me on this one because you've caught me by surprise here. We'll go with uh, Tyson. Let's then. go with <laughs> Tyson Foods. Yeah, let's go with Tyson Foods because that'll be on it. So I'm glad you've said Tyson Foods. You guys tell me it's not. No, it's not on the Dow. But Is I am glad it? that you. There was another. <laughs> uh, there was another perfectly oh, sensible. Um, suggestion that you could have had i will tell you what that was in a moment because i'll let steve have his last go just to see if he can get near the top end of this i was just gonna say i mean i'm stumped but surely paul mentioned apple before but didn't actually pick apple but it's bigger than tyson so apple yeah i know no i was correct steve you didn't did i not say apple no you picked something else instead Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Are you going to tell us Amazon's on the Dow? <laughs> it isn't on the Dow, is it? Yeah. Amazon is, Amazon is not on the Dow, no. Oh, good. Um, there's no, sometimes talk of Amazon I... splitting itself to try and get its price down enough to be on the Dow, because if it was included, it would take up nearly yeah. the whole damn index. Hmm. Microsoft? Uh, Microsoft. Microsoft oh, yeah. is on the Dow. Um <sighs> has a higher share price than Apple. The one that I thought you were going to go for, Paul, and I worried that you were going to go for it, was MasterCard, because Amex is on there, Visa's on there, MasterCard's not, um, but MasterCard has a higher oh. share price than either of those two. Mm. Uh, and I was worried yeah, you were going to wander yeah. into I was, like I was thinking track. Visa, but I didn't think Visa was going to be on there. Oh, my God. I mean, you are essentially picking from 30 companies of, of the 7,000, so... There's like, back yeah. Yeah. Back I'll, I'll take them. No. Who's the biggest no. thing? No, uh, you got it. You got it first Who time. Who's the biggest United Health. United. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Second is Goldman Sachs. Oh well. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. I wasn't sure if financials were on there. Like, so I had these uh, JPM in my head, and I was going. Oh, they're, they're JPM is on there. But, yeah. Fair enough. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry about that, everyone. Um... <laughs> <laughs> that was a disaster of showing, um, particularly for me. Uh, you can just berate me in the comments for not knowing any of the <laughs> any of the stocks in the Dow. Wow, that's really that's hit me hard. I'm going to go revise the Dow now for absolutely no reason other than to just say that I can do this game on here. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's move on uh, because we've got a lot to cover today uh, with earnings week going on. Um, First of all, um, what did we want to start with? Because, you know, just some crazy stuff. So we'll start with uh, an interesting one, Starbucks, I think. Uh, Steve W's got a bit on Starbucks. Um, I haven't watched Starbucks. For some reason for me, Starbucks just isn't a stock worth looking at to me. I know it's a dividend stock. I know it's a dividend grower and there's a lot to it, but it's just one that doesn't interest me. It's not, it's not a product I would ever buy. So I don't look. So I am really blind here as blind as I was in the first 10 minutes of this video. So, um, yeah, lay it on us. What, what's happened with Starbucks? So Starbucks has recently been announced as an addition to the Dow. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, Starbucks has... Uh... <laughs> I almost just spat this out. <laughs> <laughs> Starbucks has recently um, <laughs> reported its earnings this week, uh, and its earnings seem to be pretty good. So... The reason I'm really interested in this one is because when I try to think about earnings, I try to think about what we might usefully talk about on this show. Starbucks ticks a few boxes for things we might usefully kind of direct people towards because their earnings report was 
pretty good and the stock went down 3% immediately. And in those kind of situations, it's natural to sort of wonder why on these kind of uh, stories. So they did pretty well. I think they beat both their estimates uh, on this. They're up uh, earnings wise on operating earnings 86% over last year. Now, uh, last year, of course, is a pretty weak year for Starbucks. They do pretty poorly when everyone's shutting their houses and not going in. Um, product that Paul wouldn't use, product that nobody is using then. So that comp is quite weak. Uh, it doesn't tell you very much here, but it looks like a big number. So if you go back two years, uh, they're up 9% compared to 2019, which is, again, impressive. 9% on average, same store sales, which is a stat that people like for these sorts of things. And I was listening to a Motley Fool podcast that said, this is great. This is really impressive. Uh, they're growing a business the size of Starbucks, which makes coffee. And how much coffee can you get people to drink um, at 9% on, let's call it a year or so? And they were work trying to wonder why the stock is down. I My sense here is that 9% for a company with the PE ratios of Starbucks isn't actually that great. It's trading on a price earnings of about 40 odd, but about 30 times 2019 sales. And my sort of sense is that if you're looking at paying what is basically a tech multiple uh, somewhere in the 30s or even higher than that, you should be looking at kind of techie levels of growth. I get that Starbucks is a firmly entrenched, big dominant player in its kind of industry. And actually, I quite accept that this is a really good management success, managing to squeeze another 9% out of a company the size of Starbucks in an industry like that. Uh, and I take the point it's been really, really well run. But ultimately, that might just mean it's kind of hard for this company to do very, very well uh, as a company. And that's kind of what I take away from this particular earnings call. So it I didn't know that it was running at a P of... 40 at the moment at the moment but i do understand why certain companies that aren't that aren't growing at tech growth levels i can understand why those com why certain companies can be stupidly high and i would expect companies like unilever uh, coca-cola mcdonald's you know those classic entrenched in your head wide moat branded stocks i expect them to be trading at a higher multiple but when you're saying 40 uh, we're just getting stupid levels now, aren't we? And you can understand why there has been or why we might be starting to see that little bit of a, a reversion to the mean because these stocks are stupidly high. Uh, the whole market is stupidly high and there only are there are only a couple of gems out there as, as far as we can tell. Is there something in the safety? Would you buy a stock for more than it's worth or at quite high inflated PE ratios just because it offers an element or a traditional element of safety? I definitely get that thought that there's a sense in which, look, it's quite a predictable sort of business. I mean, here's another way in which it's made itself predictable that came out on the earnings call for what it's worth. One thing that we're seeing across the board with um, companies like Starbucks that basically take some product and turn it into some other product, we talked about Unilever last time, is there's this thing called inflation, which is driving up all their costs, right? Um, here's the thing that Starbucks have done well. Uh, they've been hit, well, their industry has been hit particularly hard by uh, frost in Brazil, which has uh, ruined coffee bean uh, supplies and driven up prices huge on that. Starbucks are pretty much unaffected by this because they fixed their coffee prices. So they've more or less made themselves inflation proof by um, fixing on okay. that kind of thing. So there's good security here. There's good management. The question that you're asking here is then, OK, that makes their earnings much more predictable in a certain way because their input cost is now fixed um, and they're a fairly reliable company. Would you pay a premium multiple in exchange for that kind of security in place of that growth? Yeah, maybe in part of my portfolio. I mean, they generate a lot of money on return on invested capital. That's a very high number for a company like them, which... They're listed as a cyclical. I think of them as kind of defensive. Um, but I take that thought, though. I, th I think uh, they're, making that, here gets a price. they're making that stride, aren't they? But, but their, their growth is going to slow. It has to slow. You can't. We've got in just in places like Birmingham, you've got you've got Starbucks next to Starbucks. Like they, it's, it's absolutely stupid. They can't possibly be on every single address on every single street. But. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. People do pay for that little bit of safety, and I think it is going from this cyclical uh, style stock to more of a defensive, and it's going to have to grow in that way. And obviously, it's got that huge dividend growth. It's got that a lot of returning to its shareholders. I don't know what share buyback program is like, but I'm imagining it's absolutely 
crazy. Um, but yeah, it's there's a lot. So did most investors think that this, because I saw the, the news today of the Brazilian frost that's caused the problem with the coffee beans. Did most investors think that this was going to affect Starbucks? And obviously now you could take advantage maybe of a 3% share, share price drop because of this misinformation that might be out there? I'm not sure. The podcast I heard on this from Motley Fool was basically saying, look, if you want Starbucks, it's at a 3% discount. Uh, this was the day after their kind of earnings for what they took to be no reason at all. Um, I thought those were sort mm. of slightly underwhelming growth numbers for that uh, multiple. And that's kind of what I saw happening here. And there's a couple of themes coming through yeah. from Starbucks where if we think more broadly and outside this particular company, themes like slowing growth, and um, higher input costs, uh, Starbucks have hedged themselves out of that quite well uh, in ways that various other companies do as well. Th those are things that seem to me to be quite central themes to this kind of season's earnings call more generally than just in this company. There you go. Stupidly overpriced. Oh, oh, go on, go on, Steve. I thought you were going to say something quicker. Go no, that was it. That was it. I wouldn't pay it. I just wouldn't pay it for 9% growth. It's just... Uh... It's, it's a very predictable business. I think it's a very dependable business, but I would be looking to buy that one uh, half the valuation. Um, whether you'll ever get there yeah. is, a, is a different is a different thing. Agreed. It's you want one of it. these ones. You want in that one less than twenty. You want it at, uh, less than twenty times cash flow, really, don't you? Well, there's uh, a lot. Of, there's a lot of yeah, businesses crazy. where we would say, "Do not look at the PE. The PE is just rubbish. You know, it's a rubbish stat." With Starbucks, I think you can very much look at the PE uh, and judge the business almost wholly on that PE, um, and it's just a little bit too high at the moment. Obviously, it's it's trading yeah. on some also, two, two months of crap. Remember, there's two months of crap and two months of good in that PE, so it's probably a thirty PE really, yeah. or maybe a thirty-five PE, but it's still high. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also, probably wouldn't pay the prices for the coffee that they sell. Uh, I do like the taste of it, but I've never bought a, a Starbucks coffee in my life. I've always got them for free if I can. <laughs> that makes sense to me. It feels to me like kind of finance YouTuber 101 when you're into sort of personal finance, which I know you kind of partly are, all as well as kind of stocks and so on, uh, seems to, to be stop drinking coffee that you pay for in places like Starbucks uh, mm. and put that money to work yeah, somewhere definitely. else, either buy a coffee machine or just uh, make your own coffee some other way or something along those lines. And I kind of feel like, I mean, this indicates to me that people don't get that message for what it's worth. Starbucks sales just keep going up um, and it's not as but a yeah. result of price shoving either. It's just more people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely, it's not just that is obviously McDonald's, KFC, any sort of fast food where they're putting a premium on on what you can make at home. So, yeah, that's that's the good financial advice. And we all knew that uh, Jeff Bezos uh, managed to get into space by uh, saving thirty four million dollars uh, on uh, not spending his own coffee, didn't he? So, like, just remember that uh, was... not, not buying coffee makes you rich. Did, okay. did you see that? Did you see that was the most tone deaf interview with him? where he was like like to thank all the amazon <laughs> shoppers and the uh, and the amazon workers you paid for this trip to space it was like it wouldn't have been even Absolutely. worse it, it would have been even worse the only thing he could have said that would have been worse with that he was like thank you for your blood <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah yeah for all for all those people that were peeing into bottles on the work on the work floor thank you to you you're <laughs> I got Your my little bitty to space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to fly yeah, my giant yeah. penis-shaped <laughs> rocket into space for four minutes. Thank you for your blood. Yeah, he ob he obviously doesn't have access to the Amazon uh, awareness and media team at the moment. That's, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, can you imagine? Work. Can you imagine the PR the PR woman just <laughs> just just going? Oh no! <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on because we've got to probably get to Amazon later. But uh, the next one was Pinterest. Now, Pinterest has been down about 20% today on its earnings. Uh, adjusted earnings per share came in at 25 cents versus 13 cents. So that's absolutely blown that out of the market. Uh, 613 million revenue versus six, uh, 562 million forecast. So it's blown its revenue out of the water. Uh, but it had a little bit less. Uh, so its users went down uh, 554 million 
uh, down from 482 million, which I guess is why the um, the uh, stock has fallen 20 percent. And then, but it's ARPU, it's average revenue per user. Remember, 2021 is the year of ARPU. Uh, it, it actually went up 1.32 versus 1.17. Steve D, what has uh, happened to Pinterest? And is a 20% drop today, or it might be 18% now? Is that drop justified based on these earnings? No. Um, so the issue here is that um, Pinterest have reported Q on Q drop in uh, people using the platform, essentially. Um, and if you compare it to year on year, it's still up. So it's it's still decent growth. The issue is that, and uh, if you listen to the end call, they have lost um, about 20% of their desktop uh, browsing audience, essentially. Um of which they have commonly said are the least engaged users on the Pinterest platform. So if you look at the mobile users, mobile users are up, but they're not up enough to get rid of the desktop users that have that have vacated the platform. So as you're seeing in the numbers, the numbers are fantastic because they have increased people who are actively engaged in using the platform and who they monetize very well. They have lost people on the platform who do not use the platform very well and they do not monetize very well. So to remove 20% off the top of a stock for basically streamlining <laughs> streamlining the way they make money to me just feels a little bit silly i think that's been uh misread by the algorithm yeah it seems that this is another proof of what we said uh, quite a few episodes before user growth is not going to be anything in comparison to average revenue per user growth because I think Twitter's doing the same right now. It's, uh, that's going to see some big results going into late 2021 as it is showing that it's monetizing people better and it's not losing its users. But yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that about the desktop users, which is uh, very, very interesting. See, it's all about, it's all the details, isn't it? So it's potential. I mean, if Zach was here, he'd be shouting from the rooftops about it. And don't know where you are, Zach. Come back to us. Come back to us. Um, but um, yeah, Zach would have known that you know Pinterest is still, still uh, very, very good for it. But yeah, very interesting. Remember, look into your details, see the details, and and go. Okay, is this really what what what's written on CNBC? Is that really the truth, or is there is there much more to it? Okay, I think you're going to be stuck for the next one as well, Steve, because uh, we're going to talk about Teladoc now. Teladoc released its earnings this. Uh, week. I haven't got them in front of you. I hope you've got the Teladoc earnings in front of you. Uh, just explain what Teladoc is first, or do you want me to do that? No, you can do Teladoc. You can explain what it is, because I'm going to be talking okay, for a while. Okay, so Teladoc, it... <laughs> Teladoc is one of our favorite stocks. It is one of my favorite stocks. I just can't bring myself to buy it because I can't see... I'm not very good at sort of predicting where these growth stocks are going. I haven't got that confidence. But Teladoc is a uh, telehealth company where it's basically linking GPs up with patients and doing that over video call. It's breaking into all sorts of markets. One of its uh, top uh, products right now is, is it Better Health or is it the other one? The, one of the apps, which is a mental health kind of app, uh, which is connecting a lot of the private insurance in America, uh, particularly through mental health, private insurance is offering a lot of mental health cover in America. And this is one of the easiest ways for uh, them to monetize that or at least deliver that to their their patients. And Teladoc is really filling a gap there. A lot of good news recently. Uh, huge uh, revenue growth, as I, as I can remember, over 100 percent, I'm sure it was. But take it from there. I've tried to do my best with Teladoc on that one. Okay, so one of the things to remember with Teladoc is that uh, this time last year it was their absolute party time environment where you literally couldn't go and visit a GP because they wouldn't let you. So you would expect that Teladoc is pretty much coming up against sort of worst case scenario for them. Oh, this is this is distracting. <laughs> <laughs> but it um, might. So Teladoc. Sorry for the listeners. I've just brought my dog on camera. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, Teladoc's revenue grew um, in the last, well, this is year over year, so we're comparing to the probably their quarter of a lifetime. So it grew 108.7% to $503 um, US U.S. revenue, um, which is obviously filtering out all the international revenue, grew 120.9%. So that of that 503, 465 of it is from the U.S. So it's another over double. International revenue um, grew at 26.6% to 38 million. So that's um, pretty meager growth, but it's it's interesting. So access fee revenue, which is um, basically the revenue that they take for access to the service, um, grew 138.5% to 434 million. So again, huge growth. Uh, but not just that, they improved the gross margin by just under 7%. Uh, operating cash flow margin, Q on Q improved 14.2%. Net income margin improved 17.4%. So I just wanted to sort of like drop in here and say, the last time we talked about Teladoc off camera, I told Paul that they would be profitable in the next quarter. And he scoffed at me. So I have a Steve adjusted <laughs> profitability for you here on Teladoc. So they lost 133.8 million um, in this uh, in this quarter, so I had a really good scour through the figures to find out all anything that's revert, basically related to this Livongo and the um, the other health company major whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, so 133.8, you can minus stock based compensation, which was directly related to the major of 83 million. Amortization expenses to um, major and acquisition of Livongo was 46 million, and there was a debt extinguishment charge from buying Better Health of 31 million. So that gives them an adjusted net income, Steve adjusted net income, of 26.2 million. <laughs> so I'd like to congratulate Teladoc on their profitability and say that I won that bet. Um, <laughs> um, so, okay, let's let's just make, uh, make Teladoc, let's make um, every company. Uh, are profitable just by getting rid of all of their expenses. You know? <laughs> Let's get rid of their stock comp. Let's get if, rid of their look, pension comp. Let's get this, rid of. <laughs> if I have made a bet, this is what will happen. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got some guidance no, uh, as well for like, you. Some I, interesting I, guidance. Okay. Um, so they were expected to guide for 514.4 million. They guided for 510 to 520 million rev next quarter, which that will represent 78 and a half percent growth um, over the over the year on year. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I thought, like stats wise, is, is there anything in there that, that you want to talk about, guys? Or do you want me to move on to some uh, some stuff I pulled yes. from the earnings call? Yeah, there is in my case. Um, so stats wise, I was interested in some of the stuff around, uh, I can't remember whether you mentioned it on this one, but you sent me some stuff beforehand around these kind of chronic condition patients that you were talking about. Because when I think mm -hmm. of Teladoc in my head, and I don't own this company, um, I kind of think it as something that allows you to basically video call your GP. But that strikes me as a fairly sort of straightforward and easily copyable product. So Teladoc are merging with Livongo, attempting to get lots of other things going on. They've got a tie up with Microsoft as well, I think. And they're trying to turn themselves into a kind of full yep. healthcare suite thing. Um, and the big thing that I was told to look out for on this um, earnings call, and I did not look out for because I didn't listen to it. So I'm going to use to tell me about it instead, uh, was what's going on with patients needing chronic care for chronic conditions. So ongoing stuff, basically, from what I can mm -hmm. hear of it. Yeah, uh, well, I'll I'll get on to that because it's on a basic list of what I want to tell you is the business performed. They've got a cracking pipeline of new deals and they actually performed on, uh, on a treatment level as well. So it, it's really interesting to see it from all sort of all sort of perspectives. But I'll, I'll just quickly fly over these. So HESC, yep. they're known as Blue Cross in America. Um, so Teladoc actually provide chronic care products to HCSC. Um, next year, HCSC will be able to buy um, direct access to the diabetes and hypertension programs as well, which is what they've inherited from Livongo. So, H so that is another sort of widening of that deal with HCSC. They also signed a pretty big deal with Telefonica. Um, that is to access Telefonica in Brazil, which I think is known as Viva or Vivo. Um, and that gives them access to 60 million people uh, in Brazil. They can sign up through Telefonica to to Teladoc in Brazil. Uh, obviously, we've just mentioned about it, but Solo. Solo is, um, it's like Teladoc CMS, like a content management system, really. Um, that's what's being built into Microsoft Teams. The idea being that rather than Teladoc having to bring in another piece of software, which will 
essentially like could be uh, could almost be a competition with Teams. There's a lot of communication features in Teams that you may as well have in Teladoc, and Teladoc will integrate nicely into Teams. So it seems like a really perfect synergy. So um, and obviously, well, Microsoft just to get is- in there is that. I know that the NHS uses Microsoft Teams with an, uh, a bolt-on, uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's essentially uh, a 3D waiting room. So mm. what you have is as GP or you know people that I know uh, in mental health, they have basically a big GP waiting room. People log on, they sit in the queue online. That's, that's essentially what they're doing. And um, the GP calls them into their private office. So it does exist here in the NHS. And I, I, one of my concerns was that Teams does have to be destabilized in certain areas where it has already got its little brobby mitts on, on certain uh, healthcare applications. And that was my one of my worries for Teladoc. Uh, it's going to have to have some con- competition at some point because at the moment there just really isn't anything that compares to it, the the massive uh, network that it has. So where do you see it being able to compete? Where, where is it going to have the, the real edge over all of the competition? The idea at the moment is that it's data at scale. So the... Uh, the whole idea behind buying Livongo was not necessarily that Livongo had anything that Teladoc couldn't create in time, but you're buying all of the data that comes with it. So Livongo was a very data-driven platform. And I mean, I'll get on to how the data from Livongo has actually improved Teladoc. Um, it's a little bit later. Gorovich talks about, uh, he calls it significant breakthrough. So especially in the mental health platform, they, they put out a pretty large survey to see um how many of the people actually felt that Teladoc was beneficial um, to them and on, to the mental health and generally to the recovery. And they got some pretty poor results around the first time they did it prior to the Livongo merger. It was 8, 6. I think we got as far as 14% in one of the servers. This time it was 40%. So the data um, that's been fed to the clinicians and um, is evidently better and is evidently driving better patient outcomes. Now, the, the thing to beat Teladoc is you're going to need to have better patient outcomes for a cheaper price. The scale Teladoc's got, the data Teladoc's got, and now the patient outcomes that it's getting as well. It's going to be a hell of a beast to um, to beat. The only competitor it really has at any scale at the moment is Amwell, and the only major that Amwell has is a majority shareholder in Amwell. So it's really... There is no comparison. I I know people like to bash Teladoc. It's everyone's favourite stock to beat up because it was pretty overpriced. It it acquired Livongo, which was pretty overpriced. But right now, you're getting Livongo for free at the prices that they paid for it. Mm. That's a good good argument. I mean, obviously, I I don't bash Teladoc. I think it's going to be that thing that's going forward. And I don't think it's share price really was uh i don't think it grew massively simply because of 2020 and the the virus and things it was already growing before that people were already starting to see the benefits of this company so i do see a lot i think it went off to that massive blow off top and it went too far and i think i did say uh, at around like 150, uh, was it like 150 or maybe even 170? Yeah, it was about 170 when I said, this is a bit too steep for me now. And then I think it even went up to 300 at one point, mm, which was did. absolutely crazy. It's back down to 148 now. Uh, is this a good time to buy it? Is this, in your opinion, are you still well, buying this, accumulating it here? I bought some today, but I bought some today because of what what the CEO said today. Uh, I'm just going to quickly read off a few quotes that I've pulled out because he spoke for the best part of an hour and I've sort of pulled out sort of 10 things that I really liked what, what he said really. Um, so the, he, he started off with just this week we signed a, a significant primary 360. So primary 360 is tell it up. It's their core service essentially. Um, so a primary 360 contract with a national payer. So that is a rather large insurance payer. And they're at late stage discussions with several other health systems the pipeline here continues to grow. So that was quite an interesting one. I think there's a big deal coming by the sounds of it. Um, I thought that he was talking about HC, uh, HSCS, or 
Um, but it, it doesn't appear like that. That's it because he refused to name them when they asked later on, um, which is probably due to the sort of like secrecy of the deal. But here's a couple of others that I found. So last year, 50% of our product bookings were multi-product in nature. This year, that's over 75%. His average, our average deal size is up another 10% to where it was last year. So there's more people in the pipeline and they're actually getting more of Teladoc's product on board. So I thought that was really interesting. That's very, very important. I just want to touch it, like stop you on there and pause it so people can sort of digest that one because what makes these companies, particularly these SaaS companies, is I've forgotten the term for it because it's, I'm doing this off the top of my head, but basically what is most important for these companies at the moment is that the co the companies and businesses that are already on their books are actually increasing the amount of products that they're buying from these SaaS companies. I think CrowdStrike is a very, very important one uh, off the top of my head here. It's increased the uh, customer spend. That's the, That was the term, a very simple term that I was trying Definitely. to think of there. But it's, it, yeah. It's increasing, it's increasing the customer spend uh, with its already signed up customers. And Teladoc sounds like it's doing that. And if that's the case, this is where it starts to shoot off. This is the point where people realize, oh, actually, there's a lot going on here. Um, it's just, I think people can't get around the, uh, the uh, profitability yet. It's because they're not doing the Steve adjusted profitability. Yeah, that's true. We should all be doing the Steve Adrusted prof profitability. Yeah. That would make it a much more attractive value proposition. Yeah, yeah. you'd have a PE ratio. Uh, uh, isn't that how we ended up with Tesla at six, seven, eight, nine hundred, or whatever it was? The Steve Adjusted probably. No, that was a, that was a Parrick adjusted uh, valuation, wasn't it? Oh, was it Parrick a Patel? <laughs> yeah, that was very much yeah, a Parrick my adjusted thing. My telephone number is six eight four five eight one. That therefore, I believe the price is set to this right now today. <laughs> Can I uh, quickly fly through these last few little bits that I pulled out? I think these are really interesting. It's Go not really it. a massive discussion. It's just more about Teladoc as a as a service to people improving rather than the business mm. itself. So, so twenty percent of chronic care patients are now enrolled in multiple programs versus only six percent last year. Um, Teladoc saw a 60% year-over-year increase in total chronic care program enrollment. Um, 2,000 Teladoc users were surveyed about their virtual mental health service satisfaction. These were the results. Over 90% of them saw improvement. 40% of them said they received, uh, they reached a significant breakthrough, which is which is great, I think. Um, so they're often known as a COVID stock. So Gorovich always likes to throw in a non-COVID-19 infectious disease stat. Um, he said that the transmission is beginning to tick up for the first time since the pandemic begun. So it's actually a sign that COVID is retreating and all of our standard illnesses are returning. Um, <laughs> and they're going to launch Primary 360 with several Fortune 1000 clients in the second half of the year. He said, stay tuned for some exciting announcements. So I'm looking forward to seeing who they are. 80% um, of B2B is that visits... It's, um... Sorry, is that it's in uh, that going to be its in-house sort of its play for sort of business insurance or uh, uh, employee insurance? It, it's a benefit, isn't it? It, com it, it comes through as a benefit on a Fortune yeah. One Thousand, so it's another way of because um, Fortune One Thousand is really big on retention, which is why Progeny is a such a great stock. Um, but yeah, so I'll just quickly fly through the end then. So 80% um, of B2B visits in the quarter are related to non-infectious diseases versus 50% uh, pre-pandemic. So it's a sign of things going back to normal, essentially. Um, there wasn't a ton of information on my strengths early results other than saying that the interest in it was um, strong. So my strength is the very first Teladoc and Livongo um, product that they've developed together. Um, so it's interesting to see what, what my strength ends up being. It's meant to be a holistic... Um, sort of health and wellness kind of service. So it'd be very interesting to see how that goes. It covers, you know, both your body health, your, your mental health and, and fitness and things like that as well, as well as monitoring things like hypertension and what have you as well. So I thought it was really interesting. So I, I sort of summed it all up by saying, I, I think Teladoc continues to be grossly misunderstood. Um, I think it's a hell of a lot better business than it gets the credit for. I think people really think something like Amazon is just going to come along and, and eat its lunch when the truth is that there is... Uh, there is enough room in this business for Teladoc, for Amazon to be very successful and probably a third other, and for this company to be miles bigger than it is today. 
So that was going to be my question here, Steve. Um, on this kind of company, how sticky are these kind of things for customers? So, I mean, there's lots of different companies that appear to operate in the way that Teladoc do. And the way they appear to be doing things is just faster and better than everyone else. And that's kind of that goes one of two ways, right? Either you have to keep doing that and you have to keep being faster and keep being next and keep being better. And people stay with you because you are the best in town. Or you find some way of, uh, we like to say in investing, assembling a moat around your business. And moats sort of work two ways, right? They stop people getting in, but they also stop your damn customers getting out. Uh, they make switching costs kind of really, really high. So if you're thinking that, okay, we're wondering about Amazon and their health-related ambitions and so on, how likely do you think it is that Teladoc can kind of hang on to people in the face of competition? I think it's a tricky question to answer because um, I think virtual care is for some people and it isn't for others. So I think... When there's no option, virtual care is a perfectly fine um, sort of swap for going to your doctors. But there will be some people. Sure. I mean, I, I remember when my missus used to work in a, in a doctor's. Some some of the uh, older generation just go there for a day out. Um, they go there to have a little <laughs> chat, and they're never going to swap. You're never going to swap those people onto uh, onto. But I don't think that's the idea that Teladoc are going for. Until I think, they die. Yeah. Just just until they die. Well, I think Teladoc's uh, primary audience what... is 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 tech tech using people, and I think they'll want to stay. I mean, yeah. I I would use a virtual service over going to the doctors any day. Yeah, it's I, and I do kind of agree with it. it. There is the argument that you know you can't do a medical assessment over the phone. I think you can uh, for for the majority of things, and really all they need to do is like stick their toe up and go, "Does this look infected?" and the answer is yes, yeah, I'll get you some antibiotics, but <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think it's just going to take people a while to understand it or, or understand to, how to use it. And unfortunately, when you've got your eighty-year-olds, uh, Jesus, even some of the sixty-year-olds uh, just wouldn't be able to do it either. Once you've got them all out of the way, once once the circle of life has kind of taken its top, uh, done its job. Um, we start to we'll, we'll start to get more uptake of, of Teladoc and uh, more use. I can see where it is. I can see in the younger generation. Maybe once we get all our forty-year-olds, everyone who's like thirty-five to forty, once they've gone up a, a ten years, and they start all having their comorbidities. They need a, a bit of Ramapril here, a bit of Simfazat in here. It's um, I can see that being the most important because. I mean, for some for some of these people, their only exercise is to get out and go to the doctor's surgery. So now you can just take that away and then uh, keep your keep your revenue rolling in, keep your customer base ro rolling in. But I I honestly, uh, in answer to that question, I don't I don't see it that people would want their GP cover to come from the same place as their parcel delivery service. I don't think that's going to be. Uh, thing i think people w there will be a barrier there that would have to break for something like amazon and google and, and microsoft anyone who wants to get in i think teladoc the name will zing enough to get for people to go oh you know oh, i really think i should call my doctor yeah just give them a call on teladoc i think that's going to be better than give them a call on amazon unless they come up with a new branding name or, or change something but yeah that's it we have got very long we're, we're running over quite a bit let's get on to the next one uh, in case anyone didn't know there um steve d loves teladoc he wants to marry it and uh have babies or something with it uh, as far as i can tell so um but yeah it is it's an amazing business personally i still think for the moment i think it's uh too high i think it's come down to an amazing bit of resistance or support even uh, at about 140, 148, something like that. So it's going to be very hard for it to for the price to go any lower. But if it does, I would very seriously start considering it. It's just my sort of fair value price. The last time I looked at it was about 85, 86, something like that. I think it's probably a bit more now, but that's what I look for. I look for that mean reversion. I look for those for the earnings to come up at the same price as the as the share price either come down or stay flat. And I'm happy to wait and either miss out because I think there's plenty of time. Um, but I definitely would say that if you're looking for growth stocks, Teladoc seems to be one of the most you know one of the most important ones out there right now. And Kathy Wood loves buying it. She sold Baba at a loss to buy it. So um, there you go. 
absolutely if you want it kathy wood's buying it uh it's good a reason to buy it apparently these days so go for it okay amazon amazon today lost seven percent and i have no idea why because amazon's a fucking beast so what's happened to amazon today has anyone got the numbers for amazon right now and i've got a little bit i mean i've got the rough outline of things here you'll be amazed to hear that i don't know amazon as well as steve d knows teledoc um and to be honest i don't know what's happened <laughs> in my own life in the last three months as well as steve d knows what's happened in teledoc's last quarter um but <laughs> here's the thing with Amazon. Uh, there are basically three things you need to know about Amazon. Uh, one is that its earnings came in at a beat. Its revenue came in at a miss. That's the second thing. And the third thing is that they are forecasting slowing growth for the remaining next few quarters of this year and probably slightly into next. Uh, and that's what's brought down its um, uh, multiple, basically, and share price correspondingly. So it's um, showing good growth over the last year, over the last quarter on quarter and so on. There's nothing wrong exactly there, especially at the earnings level. One of the things that I kind of was attentive to here, and I sometimes see this in kind of earnings reports and wonder why this is the case. So for anyone who's much more superficial, much more learning like I am here, if you ever wonder why something beats on revenue and misses on earnings or beats on earnings and misses on revenue, it's generally because the revenue is coming in from some part of the business that it wasn't expected to. So Amazon's revenues came in slightly under and its earnings came in at a healthy beat. And the reason for that is that the web shop, uh, which is it's what it's known for, right? And it's about 80% of its business, I think, um, is low margin and pulled in quite, uh, well, weaker than expected uh, revenues. What did well was its advertising business and AWS. They are much higher margin. They are a much smaller part uh, of this kind of thing. So where we talk about AWS quite a lot when we talk about Amazon, because we think it's the really interesting, really high margin, really growth powering engine that basically funds all that company. And there's some truth to the idea that Amazon is a low margin online retail shop with a big web services thing behind it that more or less subsidizes it in ways that other people can't, uh, that's worth paying attention to. And these kinds of earnings reports illustrate just how true that is. We think AWS is probably worth paying for, but AWS is only a tiny part of what Amazon is. It's a bit like um, attempting to buy uh, Berkshire Hathaway to try and get access to Geico. Uh, it's only kind of part of the story here, and you're going to buy a lot of stuff that comes with it. Uh, generally speaking, when you're on a big multiple like Amazon is and you forecast slowing growth, uh, people don't like that too much. They're OK with paying big multiples for things if you're going to grow fast. But if it's the case that your kind of earnings appear to be slowing uh, and your margins appear to be contracting, not quite the case here, but is the case in some other places, that will cause your stock price to come down slightly. Uh, and Amazon's off by about 7% today. I think it's going to be fine in the long term. I don't view this as a problematic earnings call for them at all, to the point that I've bought more of it today. Um, and I've sold Kirkland Lake, which also had a very good earnings call, shot up about Ooh. 7%. So I'd take that off, put that into Amazon for the moment. So what yeah, percentage does Amazon um, take up of your portfolio now then? It's a very good question. Allow me to have a look for you. Um, it <laughs> now takes up... Uh, 21.43% of my portfolio. Wow, big. Wow, that's a big, big, big chunk of your portfolio. Very, very good. Yeah. The fangs are seeming to be the ones, because I think the fangs mostly, other than probably Netflix, are actually a pretty reasonable valuations at the moment i mean we have to talk about pe again a lot of the fangs are below the pe of the market i actually had a look at the pe ratio of the market today and it said about 45 and just for reference the uh peak of the dot com bubble was actually a pe ratio of 46 which is very very close to what levels we had at that time so uh but the fangs were all kind of around 20s to 30s. I think Apple is quite low as well. Uh, so the fangs seem to be working on the traditional models. They seem to be working quite well. You know, as their margins co contract, people get a bit scared. And 7% drop is a huge, huge um, drop for a company with such a large market cap, right? Yeah, it is if you're carting around sort of 20% of your portfolio in it. 7% uh, drop <laughs> means that you're a little bit... 
a little bit lighter than you were before, at the start of the day. I mean, you're also right in thinking that the Fangs are behaving in a number of ways quite similarly. Uh, the exception to this is Google, but a couple of them here have come down recently as a result of forecasting slowing growth. So Apple's been talking about chip shortages. There's not enough chips to put uh, Sorry, not enough um, raw materials to make M1 chips for Macs. Uh, iPhones have done extremely well for them. But again, their share price came off, I think, after earnings a little bit, not quite that much, um, as a result of slowing growth. Facebook forecasted slowing growth. That came down by, I think, probably about similar, another 7% or so. In particular, they have a problem with Apple because their targeted advertising doesn't work well behind Apple's uh, fierce privacy wall that they're setting up and makes it hard for them to targeted ad iOS customers, which is less attractive to advertisers. So there's a general theme coming through with some of the fangs, the three that I just mentioned anyway, of slowing growth means multiple contraction a little bit. You don't think well, though, Yeah, you mentioned... Sorry, go. I said, do you not think that the, the real problem with Amazon's earnings was that everybody else did so well? That was really the only thing that I got out of it, was that everybody else absolutely smashed their earnings and Amazon was expected to follow, and it missed by, not even by much, really, was it? It wasn't even enough to, to write home about. Um, what do you think? At the yeah, it's absolutely level, crazy, right. because, yeah. like, uh, yeah, the, what what's going on at the moment, right now, is... An exact example of what we've been saying for quite a while, that these markets can be really irrational and just on stupid news. And I think what we're trying to convey here is that really this earnings report was a bit of nothing. We know that Amazon's going to be fine. We It's slow in growth because it's comparing itself to the year before uh, when it had just incredible growth. And we can say the same about Netflix and Facebook as well. And then all of a sudden, oh, we we see a little bit come off come off the top, and all of a sudden, so many people are just exiting a company such as Amazon. It just shows how irrational the market can be right now when you've got companies that are ridiculously good, like Amazon, and still with potentially like very good cash flow at the moment as well. And then you've got loads of stocks which aren't even profitable, just that. P's price the sales of like 40, 50, and you're going, what is going on? And maybe it's just a matter of time before those stocks come uh, come down. But what I did want to get onto, because we're, we're running quite a lot, is uh, Google, which was the last of the fangs we've talked about. See, I think that Google it is booking the trend of the fangs at the moment, because I think in during 2020, it actually lagged quite far behind. And that was one of the reasons why I bought Google was that it it just didn't seem to be as impressive as the rest of them, even though it clearly was doing all the right things. It's doing exactly the same as Amazon in its uh, in its um, uh, cloud department. It's doing exactly the same as Roku in its TV department, and it's it's just another one of the, those businesses with all the things. And obviously, uh, the revenue was absolutely massive this year. Uh, earnings per share was 27.26 compared to 19.34 expected, which is huge. That was, I think it was probably one of the biggest beats, earnings beats this week. Uh, 61 billion in revenue versus 56 billion uh, expected. YouTube, wow, YouTube revenue was absolutely crazy. 7 billion versus 6.3. I don't know where that YouTube revenue is. Come on, YouTube, give us some of that revenue because I'm not getting any of it. Uh, <laughs> I want to see some of that. And uh, its cloud revenue was uh, up 4.63 billion. So these are huge numbers. There really wasn't anything negative in uh, Google, and the share price is really showing it. I only bought it a couple of weeks ago, and I think I'm already 15% up on it, which is, you know, that's kind of worrying to me. It worries me a lot because it shows that people are being a little bit, I don't know. Did we, did we buy it at a good time when it was lagging the other fangs and it, and now it's going to start fitting into the fangs again? It's going to start going with the pattern of Netflix, Amazon and Tesla. Uh, Tesla. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, you did is the short answer to that. Yeah, uh, you absolutely did. Google's had a great session. It's had earnings to catch up to it. It's doing really well on its advertising business. It's just launched itself into sort of 50 billion, I think, of buybacks as well coming up yeah. over the next sort of four 
quarters, which might be a good thing. I mean, it started to run into a couple of little antitrust issues, which may well amount to nothing. But it does mean that they need to be careful when trying to acquire things or trying to grow themselves by acquisition. So it might be that there's not a better use for that 50 billion than just saying, let's buy our shares back and start uh, re- returning that via a buyback scheme. Yeah. And as far as antitrust goes, I think out of all the fangs, I think they've got one of the weakest CEOs to take that on. I think that's just personal opinion and, you know, just my own sort of bias. But uh, I think the other CEOs don't have a problem with just sticking the middle middle finger up. And I'll include companies like Twitter and, and all sorts in there. They, they, they don't seem to care, but uh, uh, Sandar just does, oh, I don't know. He doesn't seem the strongest one to argue in that sort of arena. He's very much the tech guy. He's, that's my personal opinion, though. I thought he did really well in the Congress meetings. I thought he was the, the most level-headed out of the lot of them. He he knew the answers to his questions, and he blatantly knows Google inside and out. There's a reason he got the job. Um, one of the things I was yeah. just going to say is um, seven billion in revenue on YouTube. And I remember when they bought YouTube, Google, and I think they paid a billion for it or something, or maybe even seven hundred million for it okay. at the time. And I remember the ridicule of them wasting money on something that was never going to generate anything. It didn't have a pound to its name at the time. And I mean, Google often gets a really bad rep for not being able to uh, run social medias or, or any of that. That was the thing that Google was yeah. almost born to do. When Facebook came up, people were waiting for Google to just beat it up. And and it never happened. Circles, and Google Plus, it was called. It well, was Go- absolutely terrible. Circles. Go- Google Plus as well was an absolute disaster, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, but then everybody seems to just ignore YouTube, and they've they've transformed YouTube into well, what is a fantastic business. If if they were forced to spin yeah. YouTube off, I would be in front of the queue, waving my dollars at it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's it's approaching it with shorts. I haven't taken up any of the shorts yet. I was thinking about doing something like that because I think that's a it looks like a fun thing to do. Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, absolutely incredible. I think I, I wonder how far Google's got to go now before it it starts to top and tail off like the rest of them have because Amazon's after that seven seven percent drop is pretty much flat now for the year uh, still it was starting to go up a bit but it's back down to flat now um these these are just coiling to go aren't they people are accumulating these this stock and it is it is coiling particularly amazon is it's coiling ready to go i think netflix probably is as well yeah absolutely crazy anything else you got to talk about today i'll just leave you guys with it with the end the last word no, I think we've covered everything. No, just yeah, that's all love, I've got. Love Teladoc uh, by de- <laughs> by Teladoc apparently. Equity equity investor. <laughs> so, I sell promise Teladoc you we will so do. I can buy it. That's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, uh, that uh, Steve oh, makes yes. a good point there. Actually, equity investor asks us a really, really good question, and he's got a really good name as yes. well. Um, but and I've got like yeah. loads of stuff, by the way, on camera that I can show you here that I've been printing off about it. So we are going to get to this. Just not today. Yes. Yes. Yes, sorry about that. People have been asking their questions and sending their questions in, and just every week something comes up that we need to talk about. And uh, we did have the plan to talk about the questions today, but uh, it's just run over too much, and we've talked too much about uh, the stocks. I think the Teladoc section was a little bit long, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> Next time we'll do a full hour <laughs> no, on Teladoc. No. <laughs> um, Next time. Yeah. Well, well yeah, we could. Do- Next time we'll, we'll try and tell paul that there's a company in the dow yeah yeah Yeah, maybe Um, maybe (laughs) air products and chemicals air products that'd have been a good one wouldn't it oh my god you got it's down the road i bet deer's in there as well isn't it john deer's in there as well Uh, neither of those companies is in there really (laughs) no wow (laughs) see this is a hard game i'm telling you that's a hard game we've had an hour and we still don't know anything no, no, uh, I, I, I haven't really googled it. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm mad. Um, yeah, so sorry, Google. That's another one uh, that's not in there. Yeah, either. I know. I knew you were going to say that. I, I could see that one coming. Um, yes, so uh, yes, please ask the questions. A lot of people have been asking questions. We are going to start getting around to them. We're going to do them at the end of each episode. It's just a day. There's so much going on this month. I mean, we didn't even get onto China. We were going to argue about China and all sorts. Uh, we'll have to do that another week. Um, 
uh thank you very much for what uh watching listening on the apple podcast google podcast like if you're watching this on the youtube feel free to pick us up while you're where you while you're in your car or on your walk you can pick us up and listen to us on google podcast audible spotify all of those podcasts or wherever your favorite podcast listening software device whatever it is uh and also leave a comment on the youtubes at ask us a question we will answer it one week it we're just taking forever to get around to it and uh let us know if you were any good at that dow game because we were absolutely terrible uh, <laughs> i want to know if anyone's angry that we just don't know who was in the dow i bet someone's really really angry i, mean, I could, don't even know who's in the dow <laughs> yeah i can see that coming thank you very much for listening everyone and we will see you next week I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. The sucker's going up.